tutorial is brought to you by PostBargain.com, 3D props at bargain prices. In this tutorial, we'll be looking at how to make a twisted and curved horn in ZBrush. I'll be using ZBrush 3, but you can also use this technique in ZBrush 2 as well. I want to start off by saying that I personally don't model ev um, don't model anything within ZBrush. I always start off by creating the base mesh in Lightwave, and then I use ZBrush to sculpt, paint, etc, etc. But I thought that since this was a neat technique, I'd show it to you. The good thing is that even if you don't use ZBrush to mold your meshes, you can still create interesting and useful shapes in ZBrush and export them for your native 3D program. Uh, sometimes you can model things in ZBrush just for reference objects that make your modeling experience easier. Anyway, so on the screen you can see the final product. It looks kind of complex, but it's really simple to do, and I'm going to show you how. Let's start, shall we? Alright, start up ZBrush 3 as you normally would. At the welcome screen, select the other option in the menu. If you're already in ZBrush 3, just initialize so you can start things off from scratch. We start off by creating a cone object, so go to the tool menu and click on the Polymesh 3D tool to bring up the Polymesh 3D menu. With the tool menu open, select the Cone 3D tool. The Cone 3D tool is the fourth tool from the top left in the top row. Now, drag out your cone shape onto your canvas. I'd just like to make a little note here that you should remember before you go any further. When you create your cone object, the Z axis of the object is along the line from the tip of the cone to the base. If you're like me and you usually use a different 3D program, the Y axis is the most common axis you might probably consider as the center axis of your object. But in ZBrush things work differently, so don't forget to take that into account whenever you use ZBrush. Click edit so you can start editing your cone and make the changes you need. I sometimes like to see the mesh density when I'm working, so I like to turn on the polyframe option. It's not necessary, but since we will be changing the parameters of the cone, having polyframe on really helps. But once all the critical stuff is done, we'll turn it off. You'll find the polyframe button on the side under the scale, move and rotate buttons. Now, we need to add some polygons to the cone object, because it's not dense enough for what we're going to do. So, go to the initialize menu and click on the text to open the menu up. First, we'll change the horizontal density, so Highlight the text next to hdivide and change it to 72. This gives us 72 rows of polygons to work with. This is a decent amount of polygons for the moment, but if you want, you can add more. It's really up to you, but since we'll be subdividing the mesh later, just keep it around the 72 row mark. Next, change the V divide number to around 48. If you are new to ZBrush, just know that you can use the slider as well as highlighting and typing in the number manually to make the changes you need. We need to add ridges to the cone, so for that we will do a bit of creative masking. Click on the masking menu to open it. Once it's open, click on the view mask button so you can see the mask when you create it. The advantage of using a polymesh 3D object is that it comes with UV information so that it is easier to make a few functions easier for you to use. What we need to do here is mask off some columns along the height of the cone so we can create the ridges we want. The masking menu allows you to select rows and columns along your mesh to mask things to certain patterns. However, none of these functions will work until you mask your surface first. If you try to press the row or col buttons now, nothing will happen. So, we start our masking off by clicking the mask all button. Your object should now become darker to show you the areas that are masked. You may notice that when you hover over the buttons, not only do you get the full function name, but sometimes you get the hotkey as well. Sometimes it's a good idea to memorize hotkeys, but if you're like me and use many different programs, it's sometimes difficult to remember what does what. If you really want to make use of the hotkeys, you can always make your own hotkey guide, print it up and it'll give you the most important hotkeys for the program you are using. You can then stick it on your wall for easy reference. Now that your object is completely masked, we can make use of the rows and columns options. 
change both the select and skip numbers to 4. Leave the intensity and blend to 100 as we don't need to mess around with those options. However, in the future, you may want to experiment with these settings to come up with some good creative ideas. If you click the column button located above the select and skip settings, you will get a striped pattern on your cone. Because you set both the select and skip options to 4, we get 4 columns of masked polygons and 4 columns of unmasked polygons. If you wish, you can redo the mask by changing the select and skip values to whatever you want to give you fatter or thinner ridges that will run along the horn. Now that you have your fancy striped cone, you need to open the deformation menu. Go to the size option and click on the little Z button to deactivate it so that when we change the size we only affect the X and Y values. When using the deformation tools, you will be better off to use a slider than to import a value unless you are truly and surely positive of what you are doing. Also, use the slider in small increments instead of large ones because sometimes the deformations can come off stronger than you want. So, slide the size slider to the right in small increments until you get something like you see on screen. If you were to slide the slider to the left, you would be using negative values and everything would shrink. Still within the deformation menu, go down to the smooth option and turn off the Z axis like we did with the size option. Move the slider all the way to the right a few times to give us nice smooth ridges. You may notice that with the smoothing option, Sometimes you can slide the slider right across to the end and still get a decent, non-destructive result. However, this can all depend on the mesh density, what is masked and the actual result that you want. Once you are done, clear your mask from the object. You can do this in two ways. You can either go into the masking menu and select the clear button, or you can hold down the control key and click and drag a rectangle on an empty space on your canvas. Now we need to make the horn longer, so go back to the deformation menu, click on the XYZ buttons so that only the Z option is turned on. Drag the slider to the right to stretch your cone object along its length. Click once on either the scale, move or rotate buttons on the side menu so that your cone fits neatly onto your canvas. In the deformation menu, go to the twist option and turn off the X and Y buttons so that only the Z value is turned on. Slide the twist slider once or twice to give you a nice twisted horn. It looks nice, but it doesn't seem smooth enough. So, in the geometry menu, click divide once or twice to give you a denser and smoother mesh. Lastly, we need to curl the horn. So go into the deformation menu and click on the XYZ buttons for the smooth bend tool so that only the Y value is turned on. Now, move the slider just a tiny bit to the right. The smooth bend tool is quite strong, so be sure that you only slide in small increments. Also, make sure that you select the smooth bend or S-bend tool and not the normal bend tool. If you use the normal bend tool, your object will bend at a sharp angle instead of a smooth bend. And there you have it, a nice twisted and curved horn that's easy to make and looks good too. Anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed this tutorial and you can look forward to more in the future.